Okay, um, we don't have very long, and I'm sure you've got lots of questions, but I'm just going to kick off with a couple to cover sort of broad issues, and then we'll ask for questions. So, Margie, terrific. Thank you. Now, you made The Heritage Revealed in 2014. How did this come about? Are you Russian obsessed, or tell us about it? Well, I don't know. Be working. Yeah, please. Um, no, I'm not Russian obsessed. I'm I'm art obsessed, and um, I just keep finding more and more fantastic stories coming out of Russia, and nobody's doing them. And so I've made four films in Russia about different aspects of art and culture, and it's just fascinating because the art is so intertwined with the politics in a way that I don't think I can see anywhere else in the world, apart from perhaps China, mm -hmm. where, you know, you have this connection. It's really fascinating. And so I found with all the other films, the great moment was always the revolution where everything changed. So that's kind of inspired me. And so how did you make it happen? Um, it's quite a big production. It's got reconstruction, archive... Uh, interviews with uh, descendants must have been a massive piece of research um, I've got a couple of questions about where did you find them was it easy but how did you raise the finances was that already entwined with the fact there was going to be an exhibit how did you I see it was arts alliance and science and sport arts science and sport yes was that um, well it's is this microphone working yeah, yeah. I hope it is it's it, very, very difficult. I mean, I tread a different path as a filmmaker to the people who work directly out of television where, you know, it's journalism is the main, you know, the sort of incentive. And I don't use presenters, which is, you know, something I feel very strongly about. I'm very um, excited by what the, the art can do in the cinema. So art and the big screen to me is a very exciting way of showing these stories and um, so it's very very difficult to get the money for this film it took me about two years and I went to all sorts of different broadcasters and um, they were really only interested in telling the political stories and I wanted to tell the stories from the point of view of the artists and um, so this went on and on and on and talking also to various sponsors who I knew there were certain Russian sponsors who I'd worked with before, foundations and so on, but they all seemed to be tied up with putting on these massive blockbuster exhibitions. So, you know, the galleries guard their sponsors quite, you know, strongly. So I really had to look around, and then I was very lucky with this to have the um, Alicia Usmanov, who is the 19% owner of Arsenal, uh, well known for football, he also <laughs> had. Fun, yeah, yeah. You at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and he he had this foundation which was there to support artists and smaller organisations. And I had this film all ready to go, so it ticked the box. And um, the finance came through at the last minute. But I'd also already, you know, there'd been quite a lot of investment in the early stages of the film. So with every one of my films, I need to get investment at the development stage, that's crucial. So I can go to Russia, I can find out what the stories are, I can talk to people, I can make my films original, so there's actually something brand new there. And um, also I work really closely with the institutions, so they do like me, I have a, you know quite a positive story to tell about culture in Russia, and... Um, so the Hermitage experience was really good. I don't know if any of you saw the last film about the Hermitage yeah. Museum in St. Petersburg. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's done great business all over the world. And this, by the way, has just opened in America in over 100 cinemas, and it's doing amazing business in California. So, you know, there really is an audience there for art on the screen. And um, Well, you make it sound quite easy really but i can't think it was i mean so you go to russia you have good relationship with the bureaucracies and with the hermitage etc etc so you have potential access how do you find all these grandchildren and, and descendants because 
when you watch it, they seem, a few of them, almost as though it's hidden. There's, there, it's not quite out. It's not quite uh, celebrated in Russia. Was everybody very willing to speak to you? How did you find them? Well, I, th I had very, very good fixers, both in Moscow and St. Petersburg, and you know they go with me and they help me to track people down. The descendants initially thought they had really no stories to tell. They didn't realize there was a value in it. And when I started putting the film together, even I found so little interest from the Russians themselves in marking the revolution. I was amazed how they didn't seem to be prepared or there was no desire to mark this event because it obviously had, you know, had disastrous endings. And so when I started to speak to people, they were sort of really quite surprised I was making the film. And um, perhaps I was going quite early. But um, the descendants, some of them were very old, some of them were very afraid. And, you know, even with the artist who was doing the painting in his grand great grandfather's studio with mm -hmm. Len Tulov, I said, can I show what you're painting? And he said, no. <laughs> and he was simply <coughs> doing a picture of his boyfriend. He's a very, very good portrait painter and he does landscapes too, but he didn't want to show that. And um, so I respected that. But it's such a simple thing that we take for granted. And so I need to be very, very sensitive and listen to people and really be very, very careful that I'm not going to put them in any danger. And, um, you know, it's, there's a, it's a very different country. It's only three hours away, but it feels so, so far away. When you say there wasn't much interest in ce celebrating the revolution, do you mean among the art artists or amongst the bureaucracy, the Kremlin, whatever, and why? Um, well, I'm thinking more about the museums and with Gergiev in particular, because I did go to him about two years ago to see if he wanted to do, you know, collaborate with the music for this film, and it was too early and he hadn't really thought <laughs> about it. But, I mean, one of the things about working with the Russians is you have to be very, very patient, because it happens at the last minute. So. Uh, when I made the film with Gergiev at the Marinsky Theatre, I, I learned that I had to wait and wait and wait, and it's like a feudal system with one person at the top who controls absolutely everything. And so after each performance, I've been filming operas late at night, I'd have to go and wait in the sort of, you know, in the ante room, sometimes till two or three in the morning, all standing up and waiting until you had your turn to see Maestro. And so I learnt, I learnt that, and then I learnt that, you know, you do get what you want because there's a great deal, you know, they also like the exchange very much, and I was able to offer them very good distribution. Very good. Last question from me. How long did it take from being there, doing the research, doing the interviews, uh, maybe doing the reconstruction <coughs> to some degree, from beginning to picture lock? How long was that production? Uh, well, I first started writing my scripts about um, at the end of 2014. I was doing my first sort of proposals and stuff then. And so I did lots and lots. I kept continuing to upgrade what I was writing based on the access. And then when I finally got the money, it was very last minute. It was almost exactly a year ago. And when the finance came through I just went straight to Russia and I filmed it and it took me all about um, eight and a half months to make the film. Wow and how long to cut it? Um, well it was the cutting was much longer than um, I'd actually planned. Um, I had planned to go to America and do more filming and then I realized I had such good material from Russia that I balanced my budget and put that into editing instead because I thought it was more, you know, I had got such a good critical mass of storytelling. Mm. And so the edit went on and on, but you see, I always make a trailer first. So before I've even shot the film, I have to make a trailer out of what a thin air, you know, we all have to do this now. They call them a sizzler tape. And if you, you know, you're working for Netflix or something, you make something. It's a, actually for me. I much prefer this process of making a making a little film, <coughs> ninety seconds or something, that really gives a punch and mm -hmm. shows 
what you're trying to do as a filmmaker is better than um, you know rewriting your script over and over again. I think it really does convey things, but it's difficult, and you know it's difficult to get it right. You have to work out your kind of marketing and your branding and everything way it's before you know. Yeah, yeah, so it's interesting. There's lots more I'd like to ask you about the art, but I'm sure lots of people have questions. So any questions, anyone? Gentleman there. Just wait for the waving mic. Hello, thanks for your film. Thank uh, you. What do you make of this new uh, metamodernism? It's like a reaction to postmodernism. Uh, as far as I'm, I know, it started in 2009 by these two Dutch uh, philosophers. And... Um, uh, Shia LaBeouf seems to be like a, a fan of it, and a lot of his um, art um, development has been into meta modernism. And it seems to be like how everything is a bit, everyone's a bit more ironic from like watching Simpsons and uh, um, yeah, that's basically what do you make of it, or do you know anything about it, or I don't, I don't mind either. Well, that's a lovely question. That's fascinating, and I would love to work with Shia LaBeouf. So, if, you know, bring him on. I think you know it's it, it's very difficult to convince people about things that are happening now. You know, because they're gathering an audience. You know, but I love to make films with something much more contemporary, and particularly, well, this film's had a very strong young audience as well, which has been great. So. That kind of thing is really fascinating to me, and um, particularly, I think you perhaps get it more with the dance and ballet films. You know, you can find what people are doing here and now, but haven't been able to find very many political artists that have the same punch as somebody like Malievich, who are working today. I think perhaps Ai Weiwei is, you know, the the, the really most well known artist that's getting a political voice across. But I mean, I'd love to hear if anybody's got any ideas. You know, I'm really delighted to hear about them. Any other question? I have one. <laughs> so, <clears throat> it's interesting to talk about that because really, this whole movement, Malevich, uh, Chagall, Kandinsky, Rodjenko, they were only doing that work for about six, seven, eight years. It's extraordinary. I mean, it's been one of the most influential movements of the whole of the 20th century and the 21st century having a new, a new uh, resurgence. It's interesting that it happened because it was a real collaboration between art and politics and probably could not have happened at many other times in history. Could it happen again? Because the art survived but the politics has disintegrated. So do you see it as, as a possibility when you look at other art forms, other um, movements that are happening in China or India or, or Russia or America? Do you see anything like that in the pipeline? Well, I, I mean, I always go to the Venice Biennale and I'm really interested to look out and see who's doing, you know, making political art. I mean, I know artists aren't meant to be politicians, they're artists, but, you know, one is really interested to see how these different countries reflect what, what's going on. Um, so that's fascinating. doesn't always reach a wider audience, and because I'm working in this medium, I need to reach a wider <coughs> audience. Um, I think it's... Uh, you know, I'm looking with interest at the, the Chinese revolution anniversary coming up and I've been talking to the Chinese um, television companies who have asked me to make a film and so I'm kind of seeing what I can do for 2019 there was an incredible influence of the Russian art on the Chinese revolution which is really fascinating mm. so that's one thing to look at but I think you know these political ferments are really extraordinary where the artists are involved. I'm obviously looking at, at Trump and I'm not seeing any artists who are giving me, you know, <laughs> no, a, a way forward. I think that Damien Hirst is doing some new project, but I don't know if it's um, highly political. I think he's back in history. I think a lot of us tell our stories through history. It's, a, you know, it's a kind of useful. I was thinking about it too, and it, you know, it feels like almost the nearest thing you could think of is uh, the 60s and 70s in the States 
when there was the Vietnam War and, and there were uh, all those protests, etc., etc., and there were Rauschenbergs and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, who were in a way fighting the establishment in, in that. That seems quite the, the only thing I can think that, yeah. that actually has that kind of potency. It's yeah. interesting, isn't it? That is interesting. Or oh, um, did you have a question? Uh, no, I was going to jump in the conversation. Good. Yeah. <laughs> have a, Go have ahead. A mic. Just wait for the mic. Yeah, yeah. no worries. I was wait for a bit. <laughs> We're right down in the front row here. Cheers. Uh, no, based on the political connection to, to art, I was going to bring up Belarus Free Theatre and that movement and wondered if you're interested in that subject, If does it does it excite you, do, do you know about it, et cetera, et cetera, if that makes sense. Well, I don't know very much about it, but I would love to, to hear, to, hear to more learn. about it. I mean, I think theatre is obviously an incredible way of making statements. No, yeah, because uh, in Belarus at the moment, it's the last, um, yes. how would you say that? It's the last dictatorship in Europe. So what people are doing both inside and those who managed to, to escape are trying to, through art, fill the gap which is created by, by, by the politics of it. So we this is kind of connected to that, you know? So this is why I decided to bring it up and ask you for your opinion on it. Well, I'd love to talk to you more about it afterwards as well. That's, okay. that's very yeah, yeah. interesting. We shared a film on that subject. Yeah. yeah. Did... And there's a question Two. at the back yeah, there with um, David. Uh, one there and one behind. Um, is there any pressure placed on artists in Putin's Russia? Um, well, I mean, the, the question about what's the pressure for artists in Putin's Russia mm. and... Um, so, you know, I just told you a little example of this guy who's simply doing a portrait of his boyfriend. Um, there's so little that we know about what's actually being made in Russia, but there's um, I saw a fascinating show at the Pompidou recently, if anybody's going to Paris. They've just given a big donation of a few hundred paintings of the last sort of 40 years of Russian painting, and it's... Um, on show in the Pompidou, and I thought that would be a really interesting film as well, because those artists who are part of what was called the bulldozer <coughs> movement, where they literally went into Russia and they bulldozed these exhibitions, and they were forced to have, you know, shows in their garages and things. There's lots of archive, and um, those artists, maybe they're in their 70s, but I thought there's a critical mass of stories there about how they produced that art, but it only goes up to the year 2000. And, um, but you know, the, I, I think the voices need to be heard. I just don't know if it's the sort of film I could make for the cinema. I think I'd need to get um, the BBC or something to. But do you think it's that. worse now in the, last, in the last 16 years than it was in the 30 years before for artists? Well, I mean, I, th I think with Putin, he's very, very keen on this sort of going, you know, he's put an awful lot of his. Um, resources behind the restoration of St. Petersburg as, you know, and the sort of royal, you know, the role of the Tsar and Catherine the Great in reinforcing the beautiful <laughs> past of the Tsarist imperial past of St. Petersburg. So that's, um, everything's been restored. It's all looking, looking great. But I, I think with Professor Piotrowski, who runs the Hermitage, they did have, um, contemporary art exhibition there quite recently which was you know it was a bit controversial but they it, at least it came to St. St. Petersburg it's quite a, it's quite conservative even um, Louise Bourgeois piece which she gave to the hermitage had to be put in a corner it was a dog with breasts and it was kind of beautiful sculpture which you probably all know but there were a lot of complaints about it, and it was moved to a corner. And then the Chapman brothers were banned from yeah. going there. Um, so it's it's quite, you know, it's conservative. <coughs> Stalin's. Uh, yes, David. Is this on? Yes. Oh. Well, first of all, uh, fan, fan, really fascinating film. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, one observation, the, 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 the American... Uh, art movement of the 50s and 60s was, of course, financed by the CIA largely. So there's another <laughs> government supporting the art. <laughs> which is, and, but the other question is, 
really, how does this relate to the exhibition at the Royal Academy that's on? Yeah, no, the, so the question is how does, um, you know, it's about the CIA financing the American art in the 50s and also how does my film relate to the Royal Academy show? Well, the, the second question is perhaps easier to answer, but it was I was working very closely with the curator who really had the idea for the show. She's in the film, Dr. Murray. And she really, really worked hard to get that show on at the Royal Academy. It's absolutely a huge achievement because there's a great big history of those shows falling apart at the last minute. You get the brinkmanship and they say, we're not going to lend the paintings. And uh, So, you know, Dr. Murray is responsible for that show. And there's a really interesting crossover. Um, I mean, my film wasn't made in response to the show. It's not really even a companion piece. Uh, we are separate entities if you like but there's um <coughs> i think about 30 percent of the paintings we share in both and you know i hope that it's something that people will experience they can go back and forth between the show mm -hmm. and my film and go back again and i found the show absolutely amazing and i just keep going back there's so much there it's so interesting it's just extraordinary every room's got a film in it a really long piece of archive and it's the most extraordinary show so I was lucky to have that opportunity I mean the only slightly complicated thing for me was I wished that the Royal Academy had had a cinema mm -hmm. because they all want to see the film at the Royal Academy and you know it'd be really nice to have mm -hmm. have more of a crossover in the exhibition part of it and mm -hmm you know, their membership, but, you know, those things don't necessarily oh, happen. It should be so easy to do. Well, they're building one. It's going to happen in about <laughs> three years' time. <laughs> um, but, you know, we've got really friendly relations, and, you know, they've been really, really great. So, I mean, I think the thing that's been less satisfactory is the role of the BBC, because if they had, you know, helped me earlier, um, perhaps, you know, the film could have had a partnership there. And now they have... They bidded for the film against Sky. There was quite a strong auction between the two. And so um, the BBC now have the rights to show the film. They're showing it in October. They're having a big revolution season in October. And I think it'll be really interesting. So, you know, I don't know what else they're going to do. Maybe they'll be doing, you know, they'll have a series about the politics, other other things. But better late than never. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. October is an important month. Any other questions? Anyone? Yes. This might be quite a muddled question. Um, I think one of the curators near the end of the film said, now we look at this art just as art and not as a function of the historical events which produced it. And I find that very fascinating because it seems to me so connected to the revolution and the, the, the radical tra attempt to transform Russia overnight or over a decade. And I, I wonder if you have any theories. You, you said you thought it was because the consequences of the revolution were ultimately so terrible that people don't want to discuss it. But do you think that's a phenomenon in Russia now that, that they just skate over that? Because I, I hear many anecdotal stories from people who work in Russia about how it's almost as if they've gone back to the 19th century in so many ways, not only in terms of a sar like leader but also the state of the countryside and the enormous gap the sort of feudal gap and the restitution of prison sentences and the 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 double think about broadcasting and all those sort of things it's very scary i wonder if you had a view about that well there's that's a really interesting question you know it's sort of about how you know i suppose it um relates to their their feelings about the revolution and whether it was successful or not and um one of the decisions i had to make in the structure of the film was you know what was my time limit you know because with the revisionist thinking and all, all this sort of everything coming out in the early 90s and everybody looking and understanding and seeing what happened and then perhaps closing those doors again it, there's so many different versions of how long the revolution lasted. So I had to make a decision in, in my film about <clears throat> how long my time span would last. But when you go and film, you're not allowed to film in Red Square. You're not allowed to film Lenin 
in his coffin, embalmed there. You're not even allowed to do shots. So those shots that you saw of Red Square are done, you know, they're like 10 second shots, which we shot as tourists, you know. And um, and I've filmed people who have pictures of Stalin in there on the wall now, you know, so it's very much, it's a continuing complex, um, you know, it's a situation that's very, very complex. And I suppose as an outside filmmaker, I could just really focus on the art and see what that told me. But that museum director, she's the uh, director of the Trechikov Museum. She's very, very open. You know, it's Elfira Trigulova. She's been absolutely amazing. She let me film everything, anything I wanted, absolutely everything. She's very open. But, you know, then she told me in her interview that her, you know, her family had all been in Gulag and her grandfather had died and, you know, I understood then that a quarter of the population have had some experience of, of their family being in Gulag. So within living memory, it's it's very, very raw. It's, it's really hard to relate to it here. I mean, it's just, um, it's still going on. Well, very much so. <clears throat> it seems there's a, a sort of resurgence of Stalin was a great guy. Mm -hmm. He killed 10 million people, yes, but he was strong. Mm -hmm. And uh, Putin has to deal with that. Doesn't he? It's the most extraordinary situation. Any other questions, anyone? No, well, I'm going to ask one final question. Um, <clears throat> you said that, uh, you know, we have Malevich and Kand Kandinsky and Chagall left fairly soon, and that was very clever of them. Malevich and Rodenko remained. But uh, you were very keen on Klutzis. Why is that? Well, I think I'd obviously. Get Klutzis, I liked um, his art very much. And because he was, you know, I'd never really heard of him. I mean, he's very, not at all well known. He was somebody that resonated. And also when I met his granddaughter and she told his story so movingly, mm -hmm. I'd been after her father. I was trying to film him, but he was, I, he's either reluctant and too old, so I didn't meet him, and I was told, well, you're going to meet the granddaughter, and I was initially a bit disappointed, and then when I met her, she's fabulous, really great, and in fact, we got her over to London, we got her a visa, and she came over to the Royal Academy show. She'd never been to London before, and, um, you know, I just took her everywhere and introduced her to loads of artists and studio visits, and she's really amazing person so for me it was a great find to have right. her in the film Excellent. but then with Malievich and Kandinsky um, they were all very good at writing and talking and so I had this gift to have their words and you know Malievich is great you know he's a propagandist as well you know he's very clever so I got these actors and you know I um, think Tom Hollander is absolutely brilliant as in the Malievich voice that comes through is just wonderful. I was so excited and when he, you know, recorded that, I just felt it was amazing. It all came alive, you know. And then with Kandinsky is also a wonderful writer. And and the women artists, they were yeah. good writers too. So that that gave me a, a gift for the storytelling to have their point of view. Absolutely great. And great to enter that world. Um, I found it really inspiring. Thank you so much, Margie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.